After Nosferatu, it kind of became impossible for the vampire mythology to stay restricted to the pages of Bram Stoker's novel. The film had ascertained a cult following through the underground bootleg market, and by 1926 it had made its way to English-speaking territories, shocking audiences and creating a demand for more of that kind of movie. Between 1927 and 1930, Universal Studios would not only begin to establish their horror studios, but would also go on to acquire the rights to Dracula, and would produce not one, but two versions of the iconic Count. However, that's a story for another Halloween, and for the purpose of this series, I won't be covering them here, nor will I be covering the numerous sequels that Universal Studios would pump out between 1936 and 1948 as part of that run. For us, we'll be jumping from 1922 to 1958, where we'll be covering what to me is quite possibly the best adaptation of Dracula ever put to celluloid. Hammer Studios had been around since the 1930s, and was typically known for their adventure movies, sci-fi flicks, and occasional dramas. While they would dabble with elements of horror in their early days, it wasn't until 1957 that they would first properly try to establish themselves as a horror company by releasing their own unique adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. This adaptation, which ramped up the blood, gore, and lavish sets, oh, and it was also in full colour, was a crowning achievement for Hammer Studios, but it absolutely terrified Universal, who by this time had run most of their monster franchises into the ground with multiple sequels and a strict adherence to censorship laws in order to try and pull in as broad an audience as possible. Universal, rather than trying to fight a fair fight, instead decided to take the Weasley approach to Hammer's success, and they did what any good multifaceted mega studio does best. It sued the ever loving shit out of Hammer for even daring to encroach on their turf. Luckily, Hammer were wary that Universal might try this, and so from the off, they made sure that their version of Frankenstein was absolutely incomparable to the Universal picture and Hammer won, with some very minor concessions. So when it came to the next film, Dracula, again, Hammer weren't taking any chances. Once again, they made sure that the script was as different as it could be to the Universal film. They had the benefit of nearly 40 years of Dracula movies available to reference, of which they could cherry-pick the more interesting elements. They had a budget that for the time was very comfortable, and most importantly, the decision was made to stick somewhat more rigidly to the novel's original plot and premise, with several characters from the novel making appearances here. In fact, barring the minor setback which involved them renaming the film The Horror of Dracula in the US to appease Universal again, it remained Dracula in the UK and in parts of Europe, this film would go on to become not only one of Hammer's most iconic film productions, but arguably one of the best made horror films to come out of the UK in the 20th century. The plot of this is a bit of a hash together of various Dracula movies, the novel, and some ideas from the scriptwriter Jimmy Sangster. It opens with a beautiful long series of panning shots around the outside of Count Dracula's castle which immediately sets an intimidating tone and instills the kind of atmosphere that the rest of the film would carry through its runtime. Over these pans, we are slowly introduced to Jonathan Harker via extracts from his diary. Harker has travelled to Castle Dracula to become the Count's official librarian and archivist. Though he has an ulterior motive of attempting to assassinate the Count, as he's been working with fellow doctors in the field to study the subject of vampirism. He is, however, unsuccessful in his attempt to end the Count, and after a few weeks of radio silence, while quite concerned, one of Harker's friends, Dr. Van Helsing, played by the one and only Peter Cushing, decides to visit the last known area Harker was seen in an attempt to locate his friend. The villagers are hesitant to help him, but one plucks up the courage and gives Van Helsing Harker's diary. From there, Van Helsing is able to piece together what's happened to Harker. He returns to his house to inform his friend Arthur and Arthur's wife Mina that Harker is no longer with us. The reason for that being made all the more grave by the fact that Harker was set to marry Arthur's sister Lucy, 
who quite recently has been taken quite gravely ill. Lucy is then revealed to have been bitten by Count Dracula with the aim to make her one of his loves. This however ends nastily and Van Helsing and Arthur are left with no choice but to formulate a plan to try and take down Dracula once and for all, in an action packed and gruesome finale that really set the high bar for horror cinema of the time. There are a few people out there who would argue that this movie wasn't revolutionary for its time. In an age where even the implication of blood could bring down the wrath of the censors full force, let alone garishly full colour vibrant red blood at that, the Hammer version of Dracula absolutely challenged the moral compass of the film commission. I mean, you have to remind yourself here that Blood Feast, the film that would effectively begin gory cinema as a subgenre, wouldn't be made for another half a decade. And yet Hammer's here, still somewhat restrained, showing stabbings and blood drippings quite openly. This was something that they did get a kicking for by the censors at the time, and despite a very strong defence in favour of retaining these, a few scenes were removed or shortened ultimately. Two sequences of note include a scene where Dracula meets Mina in her bedroom, which was cut shorter due to it being a little bit too sexualised for late 50s standards, and the actual end scene of Dracula's demise was also heavily truncated just before release due to just how graphic it was. Between 1958 until 2012, the cut version of this movie was the only widely available one distributed on VHS and DVD until a copy of the uncut film, with the sequences intact, was located in Japan. It had quite miraculously survived a fire, and while it looked to be in horrific quality, they were able to remaster and restore the film to its original intended cut for the Blu-ray release, which I'm very proud to say sits in my collection. I was first introduced to this classic whilst I was studying film at my local college. The teacher wanted to illustrate how different and developing film techniques showed the progression of film across multiple decades, and so over six sessions we watched Nosferatu, The Universal and Hammer Dracula, Edison's Frankenstein and The Universal and Hammer Frankenstein. And the moment that opening sequence across the castle front began, I knew I was into something altogether different. It was also around this time that I found out she'd actually got this copy of the film from the staff's store reference room, that it was a VHS copy that was recorded off television about 10 to 15 years previously, and that by this point the DVD release of Horror of Dracula was plagued with two major problems. Number one, it was bloody expensive, and number two, it was bloody region locked. So I didn't actually get my hands on a copy of this film until well after the Blu-ray had come out and dropped to a reasonable price. I think the most standout thing about this film is the cinematography. A lot of vampire films tend to rely on lighting and location to try and sell the feel of the gothic aesthetic. What most filmmakers who decide to go into horror movies forget is that composition, colour and a keen attention to detail in the direction is equally if not more so important. And Horror of Dracula is the perfect example of cinematography working successfully with all facets of the production. Not only does it excel in creating a moody, dark and heavily gothic atmosphere by working with the lighting rather than against it, but the director, Terence Fisher, has a tremendously keen eye for composition, particularly with the framing and appearance of his cast, and because of this, every sequence absolutely shines twice as powerfully as it could have under any other director. There are oodles of memorable and iconic shots that pretty much would go on to define vampire movies for the following two decades at least. And when combined with this movie's dark blues, candlelit yellows and oranges and vibrant gory reds, it only further works to instill in the mind of the viewer that what they're watching is something truly special. Absolute care has been taken in crafting the shots for this film, and I cannot stress enough just how impressive it is to look at for the time of its production. A lot of this film's atmosphere stems from Terence Fisher, a man who is to Hammer what James Whale and Todd Browning were to Universal Horror. The man was frankly revolutionary, and an absolute legend of British horror filmmaking. 
Not only was he responsible for the direction of this masterpiece, but he would also help to establish Hammer's style and feel through his works on The Curse of Frankenstein, Hammer's adaptation of The Mummy, and even later productions like The Devil Rides Out. In short, the man is a golden god of this genre, and this is one of the films that really helped establish his name. On the subject of look and feel, it must be said that the set designs here are nothing short of gorgeous. Hammer horror films often revel in Victoriana gothic designs. They seem to capture a period of time that both never really existed while simultaneously feeling like it should have. This film is predominantly steeped in Victoriana, but there are some costumes and items littered throughout the film that do harken to its 50s grounding. There's plenty of rich velvets, plush furniture and tapestries, sets are sprawling and look authentic to the period they're trying to recreate. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous production, and it's almost a shame that they chose to light it so moodily and darkly, because it means the true details of this set design are often immersed in shadows. The one thing I think it's fair to mention to newcomers of the classic horror era is that the scripting, while solid from a narrative perspective, can be a little stiff on the dialogue front. It needs to be said that films from this time worked with actors who predominantly worked using received pronunciation, and as iceberg theory as a method of writing was still relatively young, that style of writing was only really developed in 1923 and even then it wasn't widely used, it means that a lot of the dialogue and conversational structuring always seems led by the idea that things need to be spelled out, and that exposition is important as audiences might not be able to follow the plot if it isn't kept slow and plodding. As cinema would evolve, the dialogue would become smoother, intentions would become more concealed, and plots open more to interpretation. But at this time, films were in a period of development and transition, and Horror of Dracula is kind of in the early midst of this movement. So the dialogue is a little bit rigid, but that's not to say the plot is poor, nor is it to say that there isn't good dialogue in this film. The script was developed and written by Jimmy Sangster, who was equally quite the revolutionary of his field. Sangster was responsible for most of the early Universal Hammer adaptations, and he also wrote the script to one of the not-quite-Hammer horror films that I've actually spoken about on this channel previously, The Nanny. Here we have one of his finest scripts, and I'll be honest, it's brilliantly crafted on two different levels both in terms of being a script that's actually enjoyable to an audience, and also in being a wonderfully perfect example of how to successfully duck a lawsuit. It's elegant and eloquent, and one of the things that I think greatly improves this film's vibe from a script standpoint is the decision to make Dracula pretty much mute throughout the majority of the film. Seriously, Dracula has a brief exchange with Jonathan Harker at the very beginning of the film, and then from there he rarely if ever said another word, not just for this film, but the entirety of the remainder of the Hammer series of Dracula films. Which I'm sure is dedication to the cause. But it does add a layer of mystery to the character, and gives him a real auspiciousness in his presence. To that end, I need to talk about the acting in this production. I'm going to be honest, I could wax lyrical about the frankly astounding transformation that befalls Christopher Lee in this production. How after his work as the monster in The Curse of Frankenstein, to see him play such a suave, intelligent, and frankly astoundingly scary incarnation of the Count, is nothing short of transformative and otherworldly. Even though, for a time, he did argue that this was his least favourite role in performance. Equally, I could talk to extreme lengths about the cool yet persistently determined performance given by Peter Cushing, a role that would probably be the closest thing to a defining role of his career that a versatile performer could have. I could talk about either of these, and in fairness, had this film had any one of those two, I'd have still been bloody impressed. No pun intended. But I feel anything I say here will really be an understatement to just how impressive these performances are. Even the supporting cast with the likes of Michael Goh and Carol Marsh really exceeded expectations, giving a well-rounded and bold set of performances. 
each of which were memorable and without a weak link in sight. Honestly, I understate just how good the performances really are, and this is taking into account the somewhat stilted dialogue of the time. I equally can't go any further without mentioning the fantastic editing that's featured throughout too. Scenes flow almost seamlessly into one another and there are some fantastic uses of cuts to mask effects, where they could have quite cheaply used transitions to show the deterioration of Dracula at the end of the film, choosing to cut instead allows for a much more interesting set of effects to be used. And it also adds emphasis to the scene by having Cushing's reactions to the carnage unfolding. Match cuts are near perfect, and other than one or two scenes where it's clear the censor's scissors have been present, uh, there is a sequence near the beginning where Harker is attacked by one of Dracula's loves, and about four seconds of it is missing due to a close-up of a bite, the rest of the film is just free-flowing, and you can really tell that this film was polished to within an inch of its life at the time. Adding to all this, the soundtrack. Oh my god, the soundtrack! Tying the entire production together and acting in both an essential and complementary way, the score for this picture is just perfect. Simply perfect. It boosts the atmosphere of the visuals with an intensity that I find difficult to describe. Without it the film would have felt a colder and poorer experience, with strings striking just at the right moments and a building atmospheric orchestral package that makes every pounce moment strike with just that little bit more intensity. As a final note, and it made me laugh when I found this out, the producers behind this film had assured the British film censors that they were definitely not trying to sex up the film by inserting overbearing images of eroticism into it. The censors were very wary, after The Curse of Frankenstein, of the amount of sexualization that was prominent in both the film and as a potential in the script for Dracula. The filmmakers eventually managed to coax the film censors into a place of comfort, however behind the scenes they had instructed musical scorer James Bernard to make the soundtrack in places as sexual as possible as a way of traversing having visuals on screen. This information didn't come out to the film censors until a couple of months after Dracula had been released, and as a knock-on result the censors would go on to be overly wary and harsh of Hammer Horror Productions with every film after this one. On the whole though, this is an exceptional soundtrack that I do feel doesn't quite receive the recognition that it should. I'll be honest, to me, if you're looking for a period adaptation of the Dracula mythos, I would very heavily argue that this is the definitive film adaptation. While it doesn't exactly follow the original source material, what it did for vampires and the idea of Dracula as a concept completely revived the idea in the minds of the general public. And with good reason. This is a damn fine movie. While I think it might just sit outside of my top 10 films of all time, it's pretty bloody close to being in there, and again, with damn good reason. Superb and iconic direction, cinematography that's pristine, is married to a creative and effective lighting, airtight editing, and a damn fine soundtrack. While I would stop short of saying that there's absolutely nothing wrong with this film, finding its flaws took me a very long time and a lot of soul searching. This one is essential. Absolutely essential viewing. The influence of this film really can't be overstated. Hammer would pretty much have market dominance over vampire films through most of the 1960s, and almost any company that attempted to try their own spin on vampire films over the following 10 to 12 years would always carry that unmistakable influence that could be traced back to this film. In fact, it would be about 12 years until the next big revolution for the vampire genre would hit the film world. And that movie in particular would fundamentally change our relationship with the creatures of the night in profound ways, for both better and worse. <laughs>